March 30th, 1970. Dear Faye, I am well, no new problems. You can, however, when time allows, write Dr. Boone of the medical staff here and tell him to provide me with medication for my sinus condition so that we will not be forced into the imposition of going through the courts for it. Also, let it be known that you are aware of the APC and brown sugar pill put off. Do you understand? When I ask for medication, the MTA gives me an APC or two and some candy pills, brown. This doesn't help me. They have better stuff that is reserved for the other cons. They're about to stretch me to my limit with this racist stuff. I'm tired of hearing it, seeing it, and I'm tired of smelling it. I know they read these letters. That's good because I want them to know that the first time they let one of these punks throw something on me, we're going to all blow like a thermonuclear bomb. I'm just not going to understand. The blacks on this floor never engage in any form of name calling, never defy the lockups, never ask the officials for anything other than the state issue. Very seldom do any of the brothers ask the officials to pass things down the tier. We do the passing. When we come out for showers, we never even talk to the other inmates or officials, but still we've been attacked in every way conceivable, considering that there are always a set of bars between us and them. It doesn't have to be this way, since the officials are segregating anyway, they could do it in such a way that there would never be any contact between blacks and whites. They could give us this side of the first floor and them the other side, or the reverse. They could even give people a choice as to whether they want to be segregated. I'm putting you on notice, Moody. Note. One of the captains at Soledad. End note. The first time I get shit thrown at me, the whole country will know how it displeases me. How ridiculous can animals get? The whites get angry with me for just existing, but they seem to get on well with the people who are holding them here, the people responsible for the living conditions that cause their frustration, for the people's libin. George March 31st, 1970 Dear Faye, I finished the legal book you sent me. Note, Anne Fagan Ginger, Minimizing Racism in Jury Trials, The Voir Dire, conducted by Charles R. Gary and People of California v. Huey P. Newton, The National Lawyers Guild, 1969. End note. Do you want it back the next time I see you, or am I free to let a couple of other brothers read it? It pertains to all of us, I believe. I read your section several times. Did you put it together yourself? It's very heavy. I'm thinking that if the Court of Appeals passes favorably on it, and other attorneys incorporate it into their defenses, we could come up with a detaining or delaying tool at least. It's good. I'd stake my life on you any time. We have a situation then where dull heavy-handed desperate types like myself run afoul of the law from time to time. Then we have the gracious, sensitive, brainy types of whom you are the quintessence to hold the legal pigs to the strictest interpretation of the Constitution possible. The cynic in me, although it allows for the short-term benefits, sees another situation building down the road, a situation where they will simply hold court at the scene, there in the streets. Malastiba for the people. George. April 1970. Dear Faye, I just got your letter with the writ article in it. You are positively my favorite person. We must take time to get acquainted. You have mentioned yourself and your other life only once. Please don't misunderstand. I simply wish to know you better. I haven't had much contact with anyone outside my family and the people who have come through these prisons in the last decade or so. And I dig people. Righteous people. I always have found it hard to really hate anyone. I loved people. I understood from the beginning that the end purpose of life was simply to live 
experience, contribute, connect, to gratify the body and mind. I began to hate when I discovered that the mystification was interjected intentionally. I can't say where it started. I can't trace it, but I believe it goes back to my earliest years. I mean the feeling that what everyone also around me accepted as right wasn't necessarily so. The family, the nuns, the pigs, I resisted them all. I know my mother likes to tell everyone that I was a good boy, but that isn't true. I've been a brigand all my life. It was these years in prison with the time and opportunity available to me for research and thought that motivated a desire to remold my character. I think that if I had been on the street from age 18 to 24, I would probably be a dope fiend or a small stakes gambler or a hump in the ground. Power to the people. George. April 4th. 1970. Dear Faye, for very obvious reasons it pains me to dwell on the past. As an individual and as the male of our order, I have only the proud flesh. Note, proud flesh is a medical term for the abnormal growth of flesh that sometimes forms around a healing wound. End note. Of very recent years to hold up as proof that I did not die in the sick bed in which I lay for so long. I've taken my lesson from the past and attempted to close it off. I've drunk deeply from the cisterns of Gaul, swam against the current in Blood Alley, urban fascist America, experienced the nose rub and shit, armed myself with a monumental hatred and tried to forget and pretend, a standard black male defense mechanism. It hasn't worked. It may just be me, but I suspect that is part of the pitiful black condition that the really bad moments record themselves so clearly and permanently in the mind, while the brief flashes of gratification are lost immediately, nightmare overhanging darkly. My recall is nearly perfect. Time has faded nothing. I recall the very first kidnap. I have lived through the passage, died on the passage laying in the unmarked, shallow graves of the millions who fertilized the American soil with their corpses, cotton and corn growing out of my chest, unto the third and fourth generation, the tenth, the hundredth. My mind ranges back and forth through the uncounted generations, and I feel all that they ever felt, but double. I can't help it. There are too many things to remind me of the twenty-three and a half hours that I'm in this cell. Not ten minutes pass without a reminder. In between, I'm left to speculate on what form the remainder will take. Down here, we hear relaxed, matter-of-fact conversations centering around how best to kill all the nation's niggers and in what order. It's not the fact that they consider killing me that upsets. They've been, quote, killing all the niggers, end quote, for nearly half a millennium now. But I am still alive. I might be the most resilient dead man in the universe. The upsetting thing is that they never take into consideration the fact that I am going to resist. Do they honestly believe that shit? They do. That's what they think of us that they have beaten and conditioned all the defense and attack reflexes from us, that the region of the mind that stores the principles upon which men base their rationale to resist is missing in us. Don't they talk of concentration camps? Don't they state that it couldn't happen in the U.S. because the fascists here are nice fascists? Not because it's impossible to incarcerate 30 million resistors, but because they are humane imperialist, enlightened fascist. Well, they've made a terrible mistake. I recall the day I was born, the first day of my generation. It was during the second and most destructive capitalist world war for colonial privilege, 
early on a rainy Wednesday morning, late September, Chicago. It happened to me in a little fold into the wall bed, in a little half flat on Racine and Lake. Dr. Rogers attended. The L train that rattled by within 15 feet of our front windows, the only two windows, screamed in at me like the banshee, portentous of pain, death, threatening and imminent. The first motion that my eyes focused on was this pink hand swinging in a wide arc in the general direction of my black ass. I stopped that hand, the left downward block, and countered the right needle finger to the eye. I was born with my defense reflexes well developed. It's going to be, kill me if you can, fool, not kill me if you please. But let them make their plans on the supposition, like slave, like son. I'm not going for it, though, and they've made my defense easier. A cop gives the keys to a group of right-wing cons. They're going to open our cells one at a time, all over the building. They don't want to escape or deal with the men who hold them here. They can solve their problems only if they kill all of us. Think about that. These guys live a few cells from me. None of them have ever lived. Most are state-raised in institutions like this one. They have nothing coming. Nothing at all. They have nothing at stake in this order of things. In defending right-wing ideals and the status quo, they're saying, in effect, that 99 years and a dark day in prison is their idea of fun. Most are in and out, and mostly in, all of their life. The periods that they pass on the outside are considered runs. Simply stated, they consider the periods spent in the joint more natural, more in keeping with their taste. Well, I understand their condition, and I know how they got that way. I could honestly sympathize with them if they were not so wrong, so stupid as to let the pigs use them. Sounds like Germany of the 30s and 40s to me. It's the same on the outside there. I'll venture to say that there's not one piece of stock, not one bond owned by anyone in any of the families of the pigs who murdered Fred Hampton. They organized marches around the country, marches and demonstrations in support of the total immediate destruction of Vietnam, and afterwards no one is able to pick up the tab. The fascists, it seems, have a standard M.O. for dealing with the lower classes. Actually, oppressive power throughout history has used it. They turn a man against himself. Think of all the innocent things that make us feel good, but that make some of us also feel guilty. Think of how the people of the lower classes weigh themselves against the men who rule. Consider the con going through the courts on a capital offense who supports capital punishment. I swear I heard something just like that today. Look how long Hershey ran selective service. Blacks embrace capitalism, the most unnatural and outstanding example of man against himself that history can offer. After the Civil War, the form of slavery changed from chattel to economic slavery, and we were thrown onto the labor market to compete at a disadvantage with poor whites. Ever since that time, our principal enemy must be isolated and identified as capitalism. The slaver was and is the factory owner, the businessman of capitalist America, the man responsible for employment, wages, prices, control of the nation's institutions and culture. It was the capitalist infrastructure of Europe and the U.S. which was responsible for the rape of Africa and Asia. Capitalism murdered those 30 million in the Congo. Believe me, the European and Anglo-American capitalists would never have wasted the ball and powder 
were it not for the profit principle. The men, all the men who went into Africa and Asia, the fleas who climbed on that elephant's back with rape on their minds, richly deserve all that they are called. Every one of them deserved to die for their crimes. So do the ones who are still in Vietnam, Angola, Union of South Africa, USA. But we must not allow the emotional aspects of these issues, the scum at the surface, to obstruct our view of the big picture, the whole rotten hunk. It was capitalism that armed the ships, free enterprise that launched them, private ownership of property that fed the troops, imperialism took up where the slave trade left off. It wasn't until after the slave trade ended that America, England, France, and the Netherlands invaded and settled in on Afro-Asian soil in earnest. As the European Industrial Revolution took hold, new economic attractions replaced the older ones. Shadow slavery was replaced by neo-slavery. Capitalism, free enterprise, private ownership of public property armed and launched the ships and fed the troops. It should be clear that it was the profit motive that kept them there. It was the profit motive that built the tenement house and the city project. Profit and loss prevents repairs and maintenance. Free enterprise brought the monopolistic chain store into the neighborhood. The concept of private ownership of facilities that the people need to exist brought the legions of hip shooting, brainless pigs down upon our heads, our homes, our streets. They are there to protect the entrepreneur, his chain store and his property that you are renting, his bank. If the entrepreneur decides that he no longer wants to sell you food, let's say because the Yankee dollar that we value so dearly has suddenly lost its last 30 cents of purchasing power, private ownership means that the only way many of the people will eat is to break the law. Fat Rat Daily has ordered all looters shot. Black Capitalism, Black Against Itself The silliest contradiction in a long train of spineless, mindless contradictions. Another painless ultimate remedy, be a better fascist than the fascist. Bill Cosby, acting out the establishment, agent, what message was this soul brother conveying to our children? I spy was certainly programmed to a child's mentality. This running dog in the company of a fascist with a cause, a flunky's flunky, was transmitting the credo of the slave to our youth, the mod version of the old house nigger. We can never learn to trust as long as we have them. They are as much a part of the repression, more even than the real life rat in the form of pig. Aren't they telling our kids that it is romantic to be a running dog? The kids are so hungry to see the black male do some shooting and throw some hands that they can't help themselves from identifying with the quizlings. So first they turn us against ourselves, precluding all possibility of trust. Then fascism takes any latent divisible forces and develops them into divisions in fact. Racism, nationalism, religions. You have Spick, Dago, Jew, Jap, Chink, Gook, Pineapple, and the omnibus nigger to represent the nations of Africa. The point being that it is easier to persuade that little man who joined the army to see the world and who has never murdered before to murder a Gook. Well, it's not quite like murdering a man. Polak, Frog, Kraut, etc. The wheels just fell off altogether in the 30s. People in certain circles like to forget it, and any reference to the period draws from these circles, 
such defensive epithets as old fashioned, simple old style socialism, and out of date. But fashion doesn't concern me. I'm after the facts. The facts are that no one, absolutely no one in the Western world, and very few anywhere else, this includes even those who may have been born yesterday is unaffected by those years when capitalism's roulette wheel locked in depression. It affected every nation state on earth. Of course Russia had no stock market and consequently no business cycle, but it was affected by the war that grew out of the efforts to restart the machines and by the effect it had on other nations with which Russia has had to deal relativism enters since international capitalism was at the time in its outward peak of expansion there were no African Asian or Latin lands organized along nation state lines that were not adversely affected every society in the world that lived by a money economy was part of the depression although Russia had abandoned the forms and vacillations of capitalism it too was damaged due to the principles of relativism. If there is any question whether those years have any effect on or relevance to now, just consider the effect on today's mentality. Had the world's people been struck with hereditary cretinism all at once instead of Adam Smith's invisible hand, the analogy couldn't be more perfect. I mean Cretanism in its literal medical sense, a congenital deficiency in the secretions of the thyroid gland resulting in deformity and idiocy. Causation links that depression with World War II. The rise to power of Europe's Nazis can be attributed to the depression. The WASP fascist of America secretly desired a war with Japan to stimulate demand and control unemployment. The syllogism is perfect. So question and analyze the state of being of Europe's Jews who survive. Do the same with the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But we don't have to isolate groups. Causation and relativism link everyone inescapably with the past. None of the righteous people would even be alive had their parents died of the underconception of that period or the desperate fascist chicanery aimed at diverting the lower classes from the economic reality of class struggle. The Nazis actually succeeded in foisting upon the lower class Germans and some of the other European national groups the notion that their economic plight was due not to bad economic principles but caused by the existence of Jews within the system and the shortage of markets colonies the obvious intent being to pit lower class depressed Germans against lower class Jew instead of exploited lower class German against privileged upper-class German. The American fascists used a thousand similar devices, delaying maneuvers to prevent the people from questioning the validity of the principles upon which capitalism is founded, to turn the people against themselves, people against people, people against other groups of people, Always they will promote competition while they cooperate. Division, mistrust, a sense of isolation. The antipodes of love. The M.O. of the fascist arrangement is always to protect the capitalist class by destroying the consciousness, the trust, the unity of the lower classes. My father is in his 40s today. 35 years ago he was living through his most formative years. He was a child of the Great Depression. I want you to notice for later reference that I emphasize and differentiate 
Great Depression. There are many more international, national, and regional depressions during the period in history relevant to this comment. There are millions of blacks of my father's generation now living. They are all products of a totally depressed environment. All of the males have lived all of their lives in a terrible quandary. None were ever able to grasp that a morbid economic deprivation, an outrageous and enormous abrasion, formed the basis of their character. My father developed his character, convention, convictions, his traits, his lifestyle, out of a situation that began with his mother running out. She left him and his oldest brothers on the corner of one of the canyons in East St. Louis. They raised themselves in the streets, then on a farm somewhere in Louisiana, then in CCC camps. This brother, my father, had no formal education at all. He taught himself the essentials later on. Alone, in the most hostile jungle on earth, ruled over by the king of beasts in the first throes of a bloody and protracted death. Alone, in the most savage moment of history, without arms and burdened by a black face that he's been hiding ever since. I love this brother, my father, and when I use the word love, I am not making an attempt at rhetoric. I am attempting to express a refulgent, unrestrained emanation from the deepest, most durable region of my soul, an unshakable thing that I have never questioned, but no one can come through his ordeal without suffering the penalty of psychosis. It was the price of survival. I will venture that there are no healthy brothers of this generation. None at all. The brother has reached the prime of his life without ever showing in my presence or anywhere to my knowledge an overt manifestation of real sensitivity, affection, or sentiment. He has lived his entire life in a state of shock. Nothing can touch him now. His calm is complete. His immunity to pain is total. When I can fix his eyes, which is not often since when they are enclosed, they are shaded, I see staring back at me the expressionless mask of the zombie. But he must have loved us. Of this I am certain. Part of the credo of the neo-slave, the latter-day slave, who is free to move from place to place if he can come by the means, is to shuffle away from any situation that becomes too difficult. He stayed with us, worked 16 hours a day, after which he would eat, bathe, and sleep, period. He never owned more than two pairs of shoes in his life, and in the time... I was living with him never more than one suit, never took a drink, never went to a nightclub, expressed no feelings about such things, and never once reminded any of us, or so it seemed, never expected any notice of the fact that he was giving to us all of the life force and activity that the monster machine had left to him. The part that the machine seized that death of the spirit visited upon him by a world that he never influenced was mourned by us and most certainly by me but none ever made a real effort to give him solace how do you console a man who is unapproachable he came to visit me when I was in San Quentin he was in his forties then too and age in men when they have grown full. I had decided to reach for my father to force him with my revolutionary dialectic to question some of the mental barricades he'd thrown up to protect his body from what to him was an undefinable 
and omnipresent enemy. An enemy that will starve his body, expose it to the elements, chain his body, jail it, club it, rip it, hang it, electrify it, and poison gas it. I would have him understand that although he had saved his body, he had done so at a terrible cost to his mind. I felt that if I could superimpose the explosive doctrine of self-determination through people's government and revolutionary culture upon what remained of his mind, draw him out into the real world, isolate and identify his real enemies. If I could hurl him through Fanon's revolutionary catharsis, I would be serving him, the people, the historical obligation. San Quentin was in the riot season. It was early January 1967. The pigs had for the last three months been on a search and destroy foray into our cells. All times of the day or night our cells were being invaded by the goon squad. You wake up, take your licks, get skin searched, and wait on the tear naked while they mangle your very few personal effects. This treatment, fear therapy, was not accorded to all, however. Some Chicanos behind dope, some whites behind extortionate activities were exempted. Mostly it came down on us. Rehabilitational terror. Every new pig must go through a period of in-service training where he learns the Gestapo arts, the full range of antibody tactics that he will be expected to use on the job. Part of this in-service training is a crash course in close order combat where the pigs are taught how to use club and sap and how to form and use the simpler karate hands where to hit a man with these hands for the best or worst effect. The new pigs usually have to serve a period on the goon squad before they fall into their regular role on the animal farm. They are always anxious to try their new skills to see if it really works. We were always forced to do something to slow them down, to demonstrate that violence was a two-edged sword. This must be done at least once every year, or we would all be as punchy and fractured as a Thai boxer before our time was up. The brothers wanted to protest. The usual protest was a strike, a work stoppage closing the sweatshops where industrial products are worked up for two cents an hour. Some people get four cents after they've been on the job for six months. The outside interest who made the profits didn't dig strikes. That meant the captain didn't like them either since it meant pressure on him from these free enterprising political connections. January in San Quentin is the worst way to be. It's cold when you don't have proper clothing. It's wet, dreary. The drab green barred buttress walls that close in the upper yard are 60 to 70 feet high. They make you feel that your condition may be permanent. On the occasion I wish to relate, my father had driven all night from Los Angeles alone. He had not slept more than a couple of hours in the last 48. We shook hands and the dialectic began. He listened while I scorned the diabolical dog, capitalism. Didn't it raise pigs and murder Vietnamese? Didn't it glut some and starve most of us? Didn't it build housing projects that resemble prisons and luxury hotels and apartments that resemble the hanging gardens on the same street? Didn't it build a hospital and then a bomb? Didn't it erect a school and then open a whorehouse? Build an airplane to sell a tranquilizer tablet? For every church, didn't it construct a prison? For each new medical discovery, didn't it produce as a byproduct ten new biological warfare agents? Didn't it aggrandize men like Hunt and Hughes and dwarf him? He said, Yes, but what can we do? There's too many of the bastards. His eyes shaded over and his mind went into a total regression. 
a relapse back through time, space, pain, neglect, a thousand dreams deferred, broken promises, forgotten ambitions, back through the hundreds of renewed hopes, shattered to a time when he was young, roaming the Louisiana countryside for something to eat. He talked for ten minutes of things that were not in the presence, people that I didn't know. We'll have to take something back to Aunt Belle. He talked of places that we have never seen together. He called me by his brother's name twice. I was so shocked I could only sit and blink. This was the guy who took nothing seriously. The level-headed, practical Negro. The work-a-day, never-complain, cool, smooth-colored gentleman. They have driven him to the abyss of madness. Just behind the white veneer waits the awesome, vindictive black madness. There are a lot of blacks living in his generation, the one of the Great Depression, when it was no longer possible to maintain the black self by serving. Even that had dried up. Blacks were beaten and killed for jobs like Porter, Bellboy, Stoker, Pearl Diver, and Boot Black. My clenched fist goes up for them. I forgive them, I understand. And if they will stop their collaboration with the fascist enemy, stop it now and support our revolution with just a nod, we'll forget and forgive them for casting us naked into a grim and deleterious world. The black colonies of America have been locked in depression since the close of the Civil War. We have lived under regional depression since the end of shadow slavery. The beginning of the new slavery was marked by massive unemployment and underemployment. That remains with us still. The Civil War destroyed the landed aristocracy. The dictatorship of the agrarian class was displaced by the dictatorship of the manufacturing capitalist class. The neo-slaver destroyed the uneconomic plantation and built upon its ruins a factory and a thousand subsidiaries to serve the factory setup. Since we had no skills outside of the farming techniques that had proved uneconomic, the subsidiary service trades and manual occupations fell to us it is still so today. We are a subsidiary culture. A depressed area within the parent monstrosity. The other four stages of the capitalist business cycle are recovery, expansion, inflation, and recession. Have we ever gone through a recovery or expansion stage? We are affected adversely by inflationary trends within the larger economy. Who suffers most when the prices of basic, necessary commodities go up? When the parent economy dips into inflation and recession, we dip into sub-depression. When it goes into depression, we go into total desperation. The difference between what my father's generation went through during the Great Depression and what we are going through now is simply a matter of degree. We can sometimes find a service to perform across the tracks. They couldn't. We can go home to mama for a meal when things get really tight. They couldn't. There's welfare and housework for mama now. Then there was no such thing as welfare. Depression is an economic condition. It is part of the capitalist business cycle. A necessary concomitant of capitalism. Its colonies, secondary markets, will always be depressed areas because the steadily decreasing labor force, decreasing and growing more skilled under the advances of automation, cast the unskilled colonial subject into economic roles that preclude economic mobility. Learning the new skills, even if we were allowed, wouldn't help. 
it wouldn't help the masses even if they learned them. It wouldn't help because there is a fixed ceiling on the labor force. The ceiling gets lower with every advance in the arts of production. Learning the newer skills would merely put us into a competition with established labor that we could not win. One that we don't want. There are absolutely no vacuums for us to fill in the business world. We don't want to capitalize on people anyway. Capitalism is the enemy. It must be destroyed. There is no other recourse. The system is not workable in view of the modern industrial city-based society. Men are born disenfranchised. The contract between ruler and ruled perpetuates this disenfranchisement. Men in positions of trust owe an equitable distribution of wealth and privilege to the men who have trusted them. Each individual born in these American cities should be born with those things that are necessary to survival. Meaningful social roles, education, medical care, food, shelter, and understanding should be guaranteed at birth. They have been part of all civilized human societies until this one. Why else do men allow other men to govern? To what purpose is a Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, or of Housing and Urban Development, etc.? Why do we give these men power over us? Why do we give them taxes for nothing? So they can say that the world owes our children nothing? This world owes each of us a living the very day we are born. If not, we can make no claims to civilization and we can stop recognizing the power of any administrator. Evolution of the huge modern city-based society has made our dependence upon government complete. Individually, we cannot feed ourselves and our children. We cannot by ourselves train and educate them at home. We cannot organize our own work inside the city structure by ourselves. Consequently, we must allow men to specialize in coordinating these activities. We pay them, honor them, and surrender control of certain aspects of our lives to them so that they will in return take each new helpless entry into the social group and work on him until he is no longer helpless, until he can start to support himself and make his contribution to the continuity of the society. If a man is born into American society with nothing coming, if the capitalist creed that runs, quote, the world doesn't owe you a living, end quote, is true, then the thing that my father's mother did is not outrageous at all. If it is true that government shouldn't organize, then the fact that my father had no place to seek help until he could help himself has little consequence. But it would also mean that we are all in the grip of some monstrous contradiction, and that we have no more claim to civilization than a pack of baboons. What is it then that really destroyed my father's comfort? that doomed his entire generation to a life without content. What is it that has been working against my generation from the day we were born through every day to this one? Capitalism and capitalist man, wrecker of worlds, scourge of the people. It cannot address itself to our needs it cannot and will not change itself to adapt to natural changes within the social structure. To the black male, the losses were most tragic of all. It will do us no good to linger over the fatalities. They are numberless and beyond our reach. But we who have survived must eventually look at ourselves and wonder why. The competition at the bottom of the social spectrum is for symbols, honors, and object. Black against itself, black against lower class whites and browns, virulent, cutthroat, backstabbing competition, the American way of life. 
but the fascists cooperate. The four estates of power form a morbid, long quadrangle. This competition has destroyed trust. Among the black males, a premium has been placed on distrust. Every other black male is viewed as the competition. The wise and practical black is the one who cares nothing for any living ass. The cynic who has gotten over any principles he may have picked up by mistake. We can express love on the supposition that the recipient will automatically use it against us as a weapon. We're going to have to start all over again. This next time around, we'll let it all hang out. We'll stop betraying ourselves and we'll add some trust and love. I do not include those who support capitalism in any appreciable degree or who feel that they have something to lose with this destruction. They are our irreconcilable enemy. We can never again trust people like Cosby, Gloves, Davis. Note, the black Chicago policeman who was reported to have shot Fred Hampton. Or the old Negro bus driver who testified in the Huey Newton trial. Any man who stands up to speak in defense of capitalism must be slapped down. Right now, our disease must be identified as capitalist man and his monstrous machine, a machine with the senseless and calloused ability to inflict these wounds programmed into its very cycle. I was born with terminal cancer, a suppurating malignant sore that attacked me in the region just beyond the eyes and moves outward to destroy my peace. It has robbed me of these 28 years. It has robbed us all for nearly half a millennium. The greatest bandit of all time. You'll stop him now. Recall the stories you've read about the other herd animals. The great American bison, the caribou, or American reindeer. The great American bison, or buffalo, he's a herd animal. Or a social animal if you prefer. Just like us in that we're social animals. We need others of our general kind about us to feel secure. Few men would enjoy total isolation. To be alone constantly is torture to normal men. The buffalo, cattle, caribou, and some others are like folks in that they need company most of the time. They need to butt shoulders and butt butts. They like to rub noses. We shake hands, slap backs, and rub lips. Of all the world's people, we blacks love the companies of others the most. We are the most socialistic. Social animals eat, sleep, and travel in company. They need this company to feel secure. This fact means that socialistic animals also need leaders. It follows logically that if the buffalo is going to eat, sleep, and travel in groups, some coordinating factor is needed or some will be sleeping when others are traveling. Without the leader-follower complex, in a crisis the company would roar off in a hundred different directions, but the buffalo did evolve the leader-follower complex as did the other social animals. If the leader of a herd of caribou loses his footing and slips to his death from some high place, it is very likely that the whole herd will die behind the leader-follower complex. The hunter understood this. Predatory man learned of the natural occurrence of leadership in all of the social animals, that each group will by nature produce a leader, and to these natural leaders fall the responsibility for coordination of the group's activity, organizing them for survival. The buffalo hunter knew that if he could isolate and identify the leader of the herd and kill him first, the rest of the herd would be helpless, at his mercy to be killed off as he saw fit. We blacks have the same problem the buffalo had. We have the same weakness also, and predatory man understands this weakness well. Huey Newton, Ahmad Evans, Bobby Seale, and hundreds of others will be murdered 
according to the fascist scheme. A sort of schematic natural selection in reverse. Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Bobby Hutton, Brother Booker, W. L. Noland, M. L. King, Featherstone, Mark Clark, and Fred Hampton. Just a few who have already gone the way of the buffalo. The effect these moves from the right have had on us is a classic textbook exercise in fascist political economy. At the instant a black head rises out of our crisis existence, is lopped off and hung from the highest courthouse or newspaper firm, our predetermined response is a schizophrenic indifference, withdrawal, and an appreciation of things that do not exist. Oh happy days, oh happy days, oh happy days, self-hypnotically induced hallucinations. The potential black leadership looks at the pitiable condition of the black herd, the corruption, the preoccupation with irrelevance, the apparent ineptitude concerning matters of survival. He knows that were he to give the average brother an M16, this brother wouldn't have anything but a club for a week. He weighs this thing that he sees in his herd against the possible risk he'll be taking at the hands of the fascists, and he naturally decides to go for himself, feeling that he can't help us because we are beyond help, that he may as well get something out of existence. These are the, quote, successful Negroes, end quote, the opposite of the failures. You find them on the ball courts and fields, the stage, pretending and playing children's games, and looking for all the world just as pitiable as the so-called failures. We were colonized by the white predatory fascist economy. It was from them that we evolved our freak subculture and the attitudes that perpetuate our conditions. These attitudes cause us to give each other up to the clan pigs. We even on occasion work gun in hand right with them. A black killed Fred Hampton. Blacks working with the CIA killed Malcolm X. Blacks are plentiful on the payroll of the many police forces that fascism must employ to protect itself from the people. These fascist subcultural attitudes have sent us to Europe, Asia, one-fourth of the fatalities in Vietnam are black fatalities, and even Africa. The Congo, during the Simha attempt to establish people's government, to die for nothing. In the recent cases of Africa and Asia, we have allowed the neo-slaver to use us to help enslave people we love. We are so confused, so foolishly simple, that we not only fail to distinguish what is generally right and what is wrong, but we also fail to appreciate what is good and not good for us in very personal matters concerning the black colony and its liberation. The ominous government economic agency whose only clear motive is to further enslave, number, and spy on us, the black agency subsidized by the government to infiltrate us and retard liberation, is accepted and by some even invited and welcomed. While the Black Panther is avoided and hard pressed to find protection among the people, the Black Panther is our brother and son the one who isn't afraid. He wasn't so lazy as the rest or so narrow and restricted in his vision. If we allow the fascist machine to destroy these brothers, our dream of eventual self-determination and control over the factors surrounding our survival is going to die with them. And the generations to come will curse and condemn us for irresponsible cowardice. I have a young courageous brother whom I love more than I love myself. 
but I have given him up to the revolution. I accept the possibility of his eventual death as I accept the possibility of my own. Some moment of weakness, a slip, a mistake, since we are the men who can make none, will bring the blow that kills. I accept this as a necessary part of our life. I don't want to raise any more black slaves. We have a determined enemy who will accept us only on a slave master basis. When I revolt, slavery dies with me. I refuse to pass it down again. The terms of my existence are founded on that. Black Mama, you're going to have to stop making cowards. Be a good boy. You're going to worry me to death, boy. Don't trust those niggas. Stop letting those bad niggas leave you around, boy. Make you a dollar, boy. Black Mama, your overriding concern with the survival of our sons is mistaken if it is survival at the cost of their manhood. The Young Panther Party member, our vanguard, must be embraced, protected, allowed to develop. We must learn from him and teach him. He'll be full grown soon, a son and brother of whom we can be proud. If he sags, we'll brace him up. When he takes a step, we'll step with him. Our dialectic, our communion, in perfect harmony, and there'll never, never be another Fred Hampton affair. Power to the people. George. April 17th, 1970. Dear Faye, Slavery is an economic condition. The classical... Chattel and today's neo-slavery must be defined in terms of economics. The chattel is a property, one man exercising the property rights of his established economic order, the other man as that property. The owner can move that property or hold it in one square yard of the earth's surface. He can let it breed other slaves or make it breed other slaves. He can sell it beat it, work it, maim it, fuck it, kill it. But if he wants to keep it and enjoy all of the benefits that property of this kind can render, he must feed it sometimes. He must clothe it against the elements. He must provide a modicum of shelter. Shadow slavery is an economic condition which manifests itself in the total loss or absence of self-determination. The new slavery, the modern variety of shadow slavery, updated to disguise itself, places the victim in a factory, or in the case of most blacks, in support roles inside and around the factory system, service trades, working for a wage. However, if work cannot be found in or around the factory complex, today's neo-slavery does not allow even for a modicum of food and shelter. You are free to starve. The sense and meaning of slavery comes through as a result of our ties to the wage. You must have it. Without it, you would starve or expose yourself to the elements. One entire day centers around the acquisition of the wage. The control of your eight or ten hours on the job is determined by others. You are left with fourteen to sixteen hours, but since you don't live at the factory, you have to subtract at least another hour for transportation. Then you are left with thirteen to fifteen hours to yourself. If you can afford three meals, you are left with ten to twelve hours. Rest is also a factor in efficiency. So we have to take eight hours away for sleeping, leaving two to four hours. But one must bathe, comb, clean teeth, shave, dress. There is no point in protracting this. I think it should be generally accepted that if a man or woman works for a wage at a job that he doesn't enjoy, and I am convinced that no one could enjoy any type of assembly line work or plumbing or hard carrying, or any job in the service trades 
then he qualifies for this definition of neo-slave. The man who owns the factory or shop or business runs your life. You are dependent on this owner. He organizes your work, the work upon which your whole life source and style depends. He indirectly determines your whole day in organizing you for work. If you don't make any more in wages than you need to live, you are a neo-slave. You qualify if you cannot afford to leave California for New York, if you cannot visit Zanzibar, Havana, Peking, or even Paris. When you get the urge, you are a slave. If you're held in one spot on this earth because of your economic status, it is just the same as being held in one spot because you are the owner's property. Here in the black colony, the pigs still beat and maim us. They murder us and call it justified homicide. A brother who had a smoking pipe in his belt was shot in the back of the head. Neo-slavery is an economic condition, a small knot of men exercising the property rights of their established economic order, organizing and controlling the lifestyle of the slave as if he were in fact property. Succinctly, an economic condition which manifests itself in the total loss or absence of self-determination. Only after this is understood and accepted can we go on to the dialectic that will help us in a remedy. A diagnosis of our discomfort is necessary before the surgery. It's always necessary to justify the letting of blood. And we don't want the knife to damage any related parts that could be spared for later use. The pig is an instrument of neo-slavery, to be hated and avoided. He is pushed to the front by the men who exercise the unnatural right over property. You've heard the patronizing shit about the thin blue line that protects property and the owners of property. The pigs are not protecting you, your home, and its contents. Recall, they never found the TV set you lost in that burglary. They're protecting the unnatural right of a few men to own the means of all of our subsistence. The pig is protecting the right of a few private individuals to own public property. The pig is merely the gun, the tool, and mentally inanimate utensil. It is necessary to destroy the gun. But destroying the gun and sparing the hand that holds it will forever relegate us to a defensive action hold our revolution in the doldrums, ultimately defeat us. The animal that holds the gun, that has loosed a pig of war on us, is a bitter ender, an intractable, gluttonous vulture who must eat at our hearts to live. Midas motivated, never satisfied, everything he touches will turn into shit. Slaying that shitty pig will have absolutely no healing effect at all if we leave this vulture to touch someone else. Spare the hand that holds the gun and it will simply fashion another. The Viet soldier has attacked and destroyed the pigs and their guns but this alone has not solved his problems. If the Kong could get to the factories and the people who own and organize them the war would end in a few months. All wars would end. The pigs who have descended upon the Vietnamese colony are the same who have come down on us. They come in all colors, though they are mainly white. Culturally, or anti-culturally, they have the same background and the same mentality. They have the same intent, to preserve the economically depressed areas of the world as secondary markets and sources of cheap raw materials for the American fascist. The black colonies inside the American fascist state are secondary markets and sources of cheap raw materials. In our case, this cheap raw material is our bodies giving all of the benefits that property of this kind can render. How much more in wages would they have to pay a white, unionized garbage collector? And black mama tricks for ten and two. Right behind the expeditionary forces, the pigs, come the missionaries and the colonial effect is complete. The missionaries, 
with the benefits of Christendom. School us on the value of symbolism, dead presidents, and the rediscount rate. The black colony lost its conscience to these missionaries, their schools, their churches, their newspapers and other periodicals destroyed the black conscience and made it almost impossible for us to determine our own best interest. The cultural links to the established capitalist society have been a lot closer than we like to admit. In the area of culture, I am using this word in the narrow sense out of necessity, we are bonded to the fascist society by chains that have strangled our intellect scrambled our wits and sent us stumbling backward in a wild disorganized retreat from reality we don't want their culture we don't want a piece of that pie it's rotten putrid repulsive to all the senses why are we rushing to board a sinking ship when we join hands with the established fascist scum in any way it gives the people of the world the righteous people of the Congo Tanzania, Sudan, of Cuba, China, Vietnam, etc., the legitimate right to hate us too. The Swedish people and their government hate the American fascists, as almost every civilized state must. They show their loathing every chance they get. The American government dresses some black clown in a stovepipe hat and sends him over as an ambassador. This black cat isn't representing the black colony. He's representing the pigs. The Swedes throw bricks at him and call for the nigger to go home. Chances are that the old slave they sent to Sweden never spent a night in the ghetto. But still he represents the black oppressed. So when the slave turns up in his tails and stovepipe lid a distorted imitation of the genuine fool, Tom Fool, the hatred felt so deeply for the American fascist state by the Swedes is transferred onto us. The government buys and trains these running dogs very carefully and sends them scrambling, tails and all, outward to represent the establishment. Whole kennels are sent to the African nations on the ambassadorial level and lower of course on the supposition that the people of these nations will be able to relate better to a black face. The leaders of these nations, if they can be counted among the righteous, are never impressed. But this sort of thing affects the African masses deeply. Several years ago, in one of the Central African states, a gathering of the people marched against the local representatives of the American government, the USIA over an issue that won't come to mind now there have been so many but they were resentful enough to carry their protest demonstration to violent extremes they threw bricks and fire and called for the slavers blood they tore down the Yankee rag and danced on it spit on it and were about to burn it they would have burned it and gone on to sack and burn the fascist propaganda center but the running dog Tom Fool stopped them harangued them and in the voice of the ventriloquist and ran old glory back to his familiar station obstructing the sun they should have hung that nigger from the flagpole by the fat part of his neck for throwing up one more barrier to the communion that we must establish with the other oppressed peoples of the world they send us to school to learn how to be so disgusting we send our children to places of learning operated by men who hate us and hate the truth it is clear that no school would be better burn it or the fascist literature burn that too then equip yourself with the little red book there is no other way to regain our senses we must destroy Johnson publications and the little black tabloids that mimic the fascist press even to their denunciations of black extremists burn them or take them over as people's collectives and give the colonies a dynamite case of self-determination, anti-colonialism, and mild think. I attended my last year of high school at Bayview High. That's in San Quentin, where I did seven years of the last ten that I have spent in jail. The schools in the joint are no different than those out there in the colony at large. 
with the exception that they are not coeducational. We use the same fascist textbooks that contain the same undercurrent of racism and overtones of nationalism. The missionaries themselves are the same. At the time, my eventual release on parole was conditional to my finishing high school and, of course, being a good boy, never showing any anger or displeasure or individuality. I was trying to fake it. I would never have been in the mission school otherwise. I was working in the daytime and attended school evenings. The biology wasn't too bad. The instructor seldom ventured an opinion outside the subjects related to science but he was exceptional. I attribute this to the fact that he was somewhat younger than the other pundits. Each of them had a fixed opinion on every material and metaphysical feature of the universe. Colonel Davis in history was outstanding for two very typical characteristics of his profession. Temperament and foolishness. True to his persuasion, this jackass was so patriotic and republican that he actually proposed he begin and end each class with a pledge of allegiance to the flag from a kneeling position. He was tall and square and gray blonde and veteran of several declared and undeclared Yankee wars. If you passed the flag without a genuflection, you had this fool to fight. I sat through his shit for a month. America the beautiful, the righteous, the only nation on earth where everyone can afford a flush toilet and a traffic ticket. All Russians were fat Tartars. The Japanese were copyists. Arabs couldn't fight and neither could the French. All Africans were primitive who didn't know when they were well off. Vietnamese were just niggers with slant eyes. There were four blacks in the class. The Chinese were so stupid that they couldn't feed themselves. Inevitably, they would have to return to the good old days and ways of the rickshaw, pigtails, the coolie, opium dens, and cat houses. I took this shit with a stony calm for one month. I tried to get out of the class five or six times. But you have to have a clear life and death situation to get out of anything once you get in. This is in keeping with the overall prison conspiracy, i.e. you have no will, you have no choice of control, so be wise and surrender. There's this sign hanging everywhere your eyes may happen to rest, begging, quote, O oh Lord, help me to accept those things I cannot change, end quote. A life-death situation is necessary to get out. That's just what I had, but I couldn't admit to it. Looks bad on the parole board report. I tried to keep ahead between myself and this representative of the silent majority. Failing this, I would fix my eyes on one of the six flags in the room, one in each corner, two on the desk, and try to endure me and this cat fell all the way out in the end. I never planned it that way. In fact, my plan was to hide my face and hang on. The session we had was completely spontaneous. It started in the opening minutes of our two-hour class. The silent majority had just completed a hymn to the great American corporate monster with the line, quote, Now haven't we all the right to be proud? I said, no. The guy glanced at me, blinked, looked away, and kept right on with his eulogy. My answer didn't register with him. He heard me, but he was positive that he heard me wrong. In the cloister of this man's mind, my displeasure, my dissatisfaction was just too impossible to be true. The good colonel had been explaining that corporate capitalism the end result of a long evolutionary chain of other economic arrangements was as perfect and flawless a system as man can ever hope to achieve. It was the only economic order that allowed for man's natural inclinations. 
the barbarous nations of Asia and Africa who had abandoned it for planned economics would ultimately fail since the incentive motive inherent within the capitalist ideal was missing. Without the profit and loss incentive, production will remain low and eventually fail. I stood up, sat on the back of my desk, put one foot on the seat, and told this cat that he just had told another lie. I don't know why I was doing this. I even felt a thrill of sympathy for the fool at first. His mouth dropped open like a shark's. His ears and forehead and nose showed that he was as red-blooded an American as anyone could ever become. In an unconscious impulse, his hands locked themselves around the base of the two flagpoles on his desk, as if to protect the little pieces of colored rag from this impudent and unpatriotic nigger who did just blaspheme. What you say, boy? I said, you've been lying for a month now about work ethics and voting processes and economic incentives. You've been lying all your life, really, and now I want to question some of this stuff. Can you stand it? I didn't wait for an answer, but continued. I've worked in factories here in this country, on assembly lines, doing production work. I've made some study of mass production procedures in heavy and light industry, and I've looked into political economy in general, and I'm certain that in everything you said in here for the last month, there was a conscious intent to misrepresent the truth, present only those parts of the truth that supported your contentions or to omit it altogether. This thing about incentive, if it's a factor in production, in order for it to influence the volume of production or the quality, it's pretty clear that this incentive must find some way of communicating itself down to the worker. I can understand an owner or executive having the desire to make money, profit, but since ambition is a very personal thing, how does it affect the attitude and productivity of the worker? His wage will be the same if he works hard, not so hard or not hard at all and it is ultimately on how hard the worker works that volume and quality depends he leaned back in his chair ran his hands through his hair palpitated about the nose and upper lip looked at his flag and then at me and answered yes well in our factory setups we have quotas to meet and foremen and efficiency experts to see that they are met. You did say quotas. That sounds like something from one of Fidel's public addresses, you know? Sugar quotas. The difference, of course, being that Fidel is depending on a cooperation that springs from a sense of participation and perhaps the knowledge that the volume and quality of production determines their general well-being rather than the personal fortunes of an owner or small group of owners. In the factories that I worked in and have observed the principal interest of most of the workers was coffee and lunch breaks or quitting time. We watched the clock, watched out for the foreman and other spies and made as many trips to the toilet as we could possibly expect to get away with. Although the profit motive may excite owner and supervisor to invest and organize for production, the index of productivity is determined by the attitudes of the worker in a plant that is not totally automated and even then it would depend on the workers in the machine, tool, and maintenance sectors to a great extent. This being the case, it is the diametrical opposite of your contention that is true. There is less real incentive based on the impulse to gain benefits inherent within the modern form of capitalism. It's clear to me that the worker who felt that the machine, the factory, all factories were in part his own would be very much concerned about productivity and quality of product, much more concerned than one who has no more at stake than an inadequate wage. But you missed the meaning of my statement. This is him talking now. 
The spur of profit and the fear of loss are the motivations that have made the capitalist system of production efficient. It automatically checks the marginal facilities and factors of production. It is responsive to demand and supply, i.e. the demands of the consumers and the availability of materials, and this responsiveness is automatic, built in, an inherent part of the system. I replied that the same can be said for any system of political economy. With planned people's economics, however, the automatic feature is dropped and demand is not stimulated artificially in the Madison Avenue sense. It's fatuous and misleading to claim profit and loss motivation a feature of capitalism only. It is a feature of all economics in all time past and present. The only difference is that with capitalism the spur is driven into the flanks of the people by relatively few individuals who by chance or bent of ferocity have been able to make fraudulent claims on the right to profit, the rights to benefit from wealth created by labor first, applied to materials from man's plural possessive source of life support, nature. In the people's republics of Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, this right to profit, to benefit from their labor and their land, is being returned to the people. The people are spurred by the profit motive collectively, a situation far more conducive to productivity since ultimately productivity depends on the attitude of the individual worker. Proportionally, China has achieved more economically in 20 years than the U.S. has in 200. They had the advantage of being able to avoid the terrible mistakes made by the U.S. and Western Europe in those 200 years. But a comparison between today's China and let's say today's India and Indonesia, where they have developed nothing economically, will point up clearly which system is best oriented to meet the needs of the people. The leadership in India stayed with capitalism, private enterprise, when China turned to revolutionary people socialism with communism projected for the future. I am certain that everyone in this room has the intelligence to understand that India's rice riots and street sleepers are not indications that China has taken the wrong road. But they're starving in China, he said with great vehemence on his feet with his hair streaming over his forehead, fist balled, chest out, shoulders thrown back. No one starves in China. That's your ignorance speaking now. You were probably just lying before, but it is possible that you are ignorant enough to think that people starve in China still, because they were starving in such great numbers when you were there in the 40s serving the fascist military industrial establishment. You people's ignorance on these matters has prompted the Chinese and other third world nations to the observation that you all live behind a veritable curtain of ignorance. There are more people starving in the U.S., in the black belt of the southeastern U.S., and in all the large cities, in the Appalachian Mountains, and the great fields of California, than in any other country on earth, with the possible exception of India. China sends grain to other countries on a long-term, interest-free loan basis. Vietnam, Egypt, Pakistan, and some others are eating Chinese surplus food supplies right now. Nigger, they just bought a hundred thousand tons of wheat from Canada last month. You did say they bought it. It means that they must be doing pretty well. The principle of economic advantage means that the people in their respective areas, nations if you prefer, with their respective differences in climate and topography, should produce that thing which is easy and natural for them to produce. With proper organization, they will be able to produce a surplus of this thing that they produce well. It is this surplus that the well-ordered society, of today at least, uses to exchange for the things that they cannot produce economically. China bought that wheat from Canada with other food products and raw materials that Canada needed. 
That deal last month was simply good economics on China's part. Canada buys beef from Argentina. Does that mean that Canada is about to collapse economically? Nothing stays the same, not even for an instant. If a thing isn't growing, it's decaying. People's government has been on the march since the close of World War II, everywhere, building, developing, challenging, and defeating capitalist-based systems that function on servitude of the people. The inevitable failure will be with capitalism. The guns of Vietnam will sound its death knell of capitalism. We know how to fight you now. Capitalism is dying right here tonight. Look at yourself. You're defeated. He was advancing on me in his Marquise of Queensberry boxing stance. I got out of the class that night. I haven't been able to get out of the joint, however. We don't want people like Davis teaching the children. He has himself been educated into insanity. His favorite platitude was that Americans, quote, enjoy hard work, desire gainful employment, and have the natural inclination to be thrifty and save, end quote. This is a shot against the automated welfare state. He believes that Americans would rather work with their hands than use a machine that could do the same work better and faster. Sounds pretty silly to me. I certainly don't like to work. No one could honestly enjoy the monotony of an assembly line and the garbage collecting, the street sweeping, the window washing. I'm all for the machines taking over in every sector of the economy where they can be applied. I wouldn't have the least difficulty in finding something to do with my time. As long as my check comes by mail, as long as I didn't have to stand in some line somewhere to pick it up, I would never have a complaint. To eat bread, quote, in the sweat of thy face, end quote, was intended as a curse. The conservatives of their privilege would have us now believe that work is great fun. The capitalist Eden fits my description of hell. To destroy it will require cooperation and communion between our related parts, communion between colony and colony, nation and nation. The common bond will be the desire to humble the oppressor, the need to destroy capitalist man and his terrible ugly machine. If there were any differences or grievances between us in the black colonies and the peoples of other colonies across the country, around the world, we should be willing to forget them in the desperate need for coordination against American fascism. International coordination is the key to defeating this thing that must expand to live. Our inability to work with other peoples, other slaves who have the same master, is a consequence of the inferiority complex we have been conditioned into. We are afraid that in the process the Chinese will trick us or the white folks who support socialism and liberation of all the American colonies really just want to use us, trick us. We can't trust them, they'll trick us. Well, if we're tricks, we can expect to get tricked, and we should rightly be fearful. This paranoia is a carryover from the days when a white face in a black crowd meant that the white brain was controlling things. It is a carryover from the days when some of us felt that nothing could function properly without the presence of a white brain. When we were sufficiently convinced of our own inferiority to allow them to take us over. Now, as things stand in the new light of different days, with our revolution in the doldrums, our struggles counterpoised by vicious political kills and avalanches of propaganda, terror and tokenism we must overcome the paranoia it is based on lack of confidence in our ability to control situations yet no one can take us over 
or betray our interest if we are vigilant and aggressively intelligent. We must accept the spirit of the true internationalism called for by Comrade Che Guevara. It is not a matter of trusting anyone, though I personally find that I can still trust certain general types of people since I am of that people. I am also assured of my ability to detect in advance many atavistic changes that portend betrayal. It isn't just a matter of trusting the good will of other slaves and other colonies and other peoples. It is simply a matter of common need. We need allies. We have a powerful enemy who cannot be defeated without an allied effort. The enemy at present is the capitalist system and its supporters. Our prime interest is to destroy them. Anyone else with this same interest must be embraced. We must work with, beside, through, over, under anyone regardless of their external physical features whose aim is the same as ours in this. Capitalism must be destroyed and after it is destroyed if we find that we still have problems we'll work them out. That is the nature of life, struggle, permanent revolution. That is the situation we were born into. There are other peoples on this earth. In denying their existence and turning inward in our misery and accepting any form of racism, we are taking on the characteristic of our enemy. We are resigning ourselves to defeat for informing a conspiracy aimed at the destructing of the system that holds us all in the throes of a desperate insecurity we must have coordinating elements connecting us and our moves to the moves of the other colonies the African colonies those in Asia and Latin America in Appalachia and the southwestern bean fields if it is more expedient for a white revolutionary to neutralize a certain area? Should I deny him the opportunity to contribute by withholding the protective influence of my cooperation? If I did, it would make me a fool and a myopic coward. A trick. The revolutionary of Vietnam, this brother is so tried, so tested, so clearly anti-fascist, anti-American, that I must be suspicious of the sincerity of any black who claims anti-Americanism and anti-fascism but who cannot embrace the Kong. The Chinese have aided every anti-colonial movement that has occurred since they were successful in their own, particularly the ones in Africa. They have offered us in the American colonies any and all support that we require, from hand grenades to H-bombs. Some of us would deny these wonderful and righteous people. I accept their assistance in my struggle with our mutual enemy. I accept and appreciate any love that we can build out of our relation in crisis. I'll never, never allow my enemy to turn my mind or hand against them. The Yankee dog that proposes to me that I should join him in containing the freedom of a Vietnamese or a Chinese brother of the revolution is going to get spat on. I don't care how much he has to offer in the way of short-term material benefits. We must establish a true internationalism with other anti-colonial peoples. Then we will be on the road of the true revolutionary. Only then can we expect to be able to seize the power that is rightfully ours, the power to control the circumstances of our day-to-day -day lives. The fascists must expand to live. Consequently, he has pushed his frontiers to the farthest lands and peoples. This is an aspect of his being, an ungovernable compulsion. This perverted mechanical monster suffers from a disease that forces him to build ugly things and destroy beauty wherever he finds it. I just read in a legal newspaper that 50% of all the people ever executed in this country by the state were black and 100% were lower class poor. I'm going to bust my heart trying to stop these smug, degenerate, primitive, omnivorous, uncivil, and anyone who
who would aid me. I embrace you. We of the black American colony must finally take courage, control our fear, and adopt a realistic picture of this world and our place within it. We are not fascists or Americans. We are an oppressed, economically depressed colonial people. We were brought here from Africa and other parts of the world of palm and sun under duress and have passed all our days here under duress. The people who run this country will never let us succeed to power. Everything in history that was of any value was taken by force. We must organize our thoughts, get behind the revolutionary vanguard, make the correct alliances this time. We must fall on our enemies, the enemies of all righteousness with a ruthless, relentless will to win. History sweeps on. We must not let it escape our influence this time. I am an extremist. I call for extreme measures to solve extreme problems. Where face and freedom are concerned, I do not use or prescribe half measures. To me, life without control over the determining factors is not worth the effort of drawing breath. Without self-determination, I am extremely displeased. International capitalism cannot be destroyed without the extremes of struggle. The entire colonial world is watching the blacks inside the U.S., wondering and waiting for us to come to our senses. Their problems and struggles with the American monster are much more difficult than they would be if we actively aided them. We are on the inside. We are the only ones beside the very small white minority left who can get at the monster's heart without subjecting the world to nuclear fire. We have a momentous historical role to act out if we will. The whole world for all time in the future will love us and remember us as the righteous people who made it possible for the world to live on. If we fail through fear and lack of aggressive imagination, then the slaves of the future will curse us as we sometimes curse those of yesterday. I don't want to die and leave a few sad songs and a hump in the ground as my only monument. I want to leave a world that is liberated from trash, pollution, racism, nation states, nation state wars and armies, from pomp, bigotry, parochialism, a thousand different brands of untruth, and licentious, usurious economics. We must build the true internationalism now. Getting to know people under crisis is the best way to learn them. Crisis situations show up their weakness and strength. They outline our humanity in vivid detail. If there is any basis for a belief in the universality of man, then we will find it in this struggle against the enemy of all mankind.